Let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles. In the first chapter, we are in a series just starting out here. And last time we saw that the disciples were kind of uh, excited about Jesus establishing this earthly kingdom. He said, uh, it's not now time, that time will come. And uh, they had their uh, first and second comings of the Lord Jesus Christ off. Christ came the first time to suffer. He's coming a second time to rule and reign. They wanted to rule and reign now, and he said in so many so many words, now is not the time. Now is the time to get out there and reach the world for Christ. And so we find here in the second part now of this first chapter some unfinished business. We're going to start in verse number 12 and read down unto the end. Then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost spake by the mouth of David concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now, this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, Akladama, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed to Jesus, or Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. You'll notice earlier on in verse number 22 at the end, it mentions this replacement has to be a witness Peter said, with us, of his resurrection, speaking of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to be talking today a little bit about witnesses of his resurrection. But let's pray before we begin. Father, we come before thee. We thank you now for this hour. We ask you to bless this time, speak to our hearts, teach us from thy word, lift up your precious son, most of all. For we pray now and ask these things in his name. Amen. If I were to ask you a question, what is it that makes the name of the Lord Jesus Christ so different from any other name? It would have to be the resurrection. He he resurrected from the dead and did something that nobody else has ever done. And if you look at all the famous people of history past, and I have a list here of dozens of them, they all have one thing in common, and that is that they died at some time in history past, and they're still dead. Uh, There's Muhammad. The, the prophet of Islam. He died in 1632. There's uh, Isaac Newton, the British mathematician and scientist. He died in 1727. A Buddha, the spiritual teacher and the founder of Buddhism, he died way back in 483 BC. Confucius, uh, the Chinese philosopher, died actually in 479 BC. And then there was Gutenberg. He invented the pres- printing press. He died in 1468. Columbus died in 1506. Einstein died in 1955. Uh, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, he died 300 years, over 300 years before the time of Christ. Uh, Charles Darwin, the scientist who, who proposed and popularized the theory of evolution, died in 1882. Martin Luther died in 1546. 
Washington died in 1799. Karl Marx died in 1883. The Wright brothers have both been dead for over 75 years. We could talk about Genghis Khan. Uh, he died in 1227, and Shakespeare died in 1662. And I've got dozens of more names here. And they all have one thing in common, and that is that they died and they're still dead. But what sets Christ apart from any other other famous figure who's ever walked this earth is the fact that he died and he rose again. Now, I believe, I believe that with all my heart. I have no doubt whatsoever that Christ rose from the dead and that today he sits on the right hand of the throne of God on high. And my faith is founded on that. I think that's the foundation of a Christian's faith. And, and every apostle left here that, that we read about here a moment ago, they were witnesses of the resurrection. They saw the Lord Jesus Christ alive, and now he's gone. Their leaders ascended. These are different days for them. And so they go back to an upper room there, and I believe the east side of Jerusalem, and they assemble there to pray. And it's quite a motley crew. If you think about these guys, I mean, here's Peter, who weeks earlier was denying the Lord and, and, and cursing like a sailor. Here's James and John, the sons of thunder, the ones who wanted to call down fire upon those who had rejected Christ. There's Philip, the calculated one, always trying to figure out, boy, is 200 penny worth enough to feed this crowd, you know? There's Thomas, the real doubter, wondering, ah, what's going to come of this? I don't think it's going to fly. And all of them really are always uh, arguing who's going to be the greatest. And <clears throat> this is the crowd now that is going to turn the world upside down. Well, this is the crowd here that it's, it's, they're going to have to step up. It, it's time to step up. And before they do, though, before a Pentecost can take place, there's some unfinished business, and they need to take care of that. And we find it here in this passage. We find what I call, first of all, a, a prayerful rapport. You take this bunch I mentioned a moment ago and, and others, and these guys a few years earlier were total strangers. They really didn't know each other at all, but now they're beloved brethren. And we find in verse number 12, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. Now, <clears throat> they leave the, the Mount of Olives, and I think they're over pretty much on the east side of it, not too far from the, the, the village of Bethany. It was a secluded private place, but they come over the summit, they come down the hill, and it's really not much of a hill. The, the Kidron Valley at the base of the Mount of Olives is about only a, a 400-foot descent, and if you stand on the Mount of Olives, really you only are looking down on Jerusalem by about 200 feet. And so we find here Luke, the writer of Acts, is describing this place to a, a probably a Roman by the name of Theophilus because he's not aware of, of, of any of this stuff here, and he's trying to give him a little bit of detail here. And he tells him that the distance they travel from the Mount of Olives back into Jerusalem is a Sabbath day's journey. What's that mean? Well, the Jews had made a rule that on the Sabbath, their Saturday, they, they could not walk more than roughly, well, 200 2,000 actually cubits. Cubits about this length here. And so they could only walk about a third to a half of a mile. The Jews had made up all kinds of rules that God had not made up. God had given to them the Sabbath as a day of rest. And he had said things like, don't gather sticks on that day and don't go out and try and find manna on that day. But the, 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 the list was pretty short and it was pretty simple. But the Jews had turned this national blessing into a national burden by making hundreds of rules, most of which Jesus just ignored. And that's why they hated him. He wasn't following their rules. He wasn't following their tradition. You know, religious mankind has always had this thing about making up tradition, religious tradition, spiritual tradition, if you will. And we find out the Bible warns us about this. In Colossians 2.8, it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and not after Christ. In other words, with this stuff, this stuff that's contrary to the doctrine of Christ. We know this is the Word of God, the Bible. But where did all this other stuff come from? All this religious tradition. 
And if you're like me, maybe you grew up in this stuff, all this tradition, all these thou shalt and thou shalt nots that really aren't found in the word of God and actually circumvent and sidestep the truth of God's word and go contrary to the truth of God's word. And we're told here to beware of it. It mentions the tradition of men. We read over in 1 Peter 1.18, uh, Peter says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, received by tradition from your fathers. You know, there's a lot of religious tradition that doesn't smack true with this book here. Things like you got to get baptized in order to get to heaven. That water washes your sin away, some original sin. It makes you a child of God. None of that's true. In fact, you won't find babies baptized in the Bible and you won't find anyone baptized in the Bible for salvation because water does not wash sin away. Amen. In fact, the Bible is clear that only the blood of Jesus Christ can wash sin away. And there are those who talk about faith, but their faith is in their baptism. Your faith better be in the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross, plus nothing, minus nothing. You cannot work your way to heaven Baptism does not make you a child of God. And you have to have a time in your life when you're born again, as Christ called it, when you realize you're a sinner on the road to hell, unable to save yourself, and in repentance you have this change of mind and you turn to Christ and you put all your faith in what he did on Calvary's cross to save you and in, <clears throat> in that blood that he shed for you. So anyway, we find out here they had made up a lot of religious tradition and none of it would save here. And we go back to our scenario here, and, and we find that the waiting begins. Because in verse number, f number uh, 5, we find out that Jesus had said, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. He didn't tell them the exact number of days. He just said, <clears throat> in, in, the, in the near future, you're going to receive this empowering. Now, notice in verse number 13. It says, and when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both, and it mentions all the disciples here that were left. There was one gone, of course, but <clears throat> they're gathering in this room here, and perhaps it's in a large house, perhaps it's a large upper room in a house, maybe owned by the mother of John Mark. That's believed by many because of a little inference mentioned in Acts 12 and verse number 12. But it was a particular room that perhaps that Christ had held the Lord's Supper in, that he had appeared to them after his resurrection, and it had now become kind of the place where they assembled together. They met, they had church services, and, and it was in now this room they were going to pray, and it was in this room that this 10-day waiting period was going to begin. They didn't know it would be 10 days. But something powerful was going to happen in just 10 days on the day of Pentecost. There was going to be a spiritual bombshell that would explode and, and detonate and affect the world forever, turning the world upside down with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It would never be the same. In verse 14, it says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Notice they're not just sitting around. They're praying. They're praying. And they're, they're, they're praying about a number of things here, but, but I think there's this prayerful rapport going on between them. They're joined at the heart. And, and we find out they're in one accord, according to verse 14. Notice those two words. <clears throat> one accord. One accord. I looked that up in the Greek, and it's this really long word that I can't pronounce, but it really means one mind, one heart. They, they, were, they were unanimous in their, their cause, their cause of, of following the Lord and searching for the lost and reaching them for Christ. And you find here different men and women. You find here different types. You find here different occupations. You find here different opinions, different backgrounds, different personalities, and, and different persuasions. But they put all that aside, and they're in one accord. They're unified for the sake of reaching the world. And by the way, a local church has to have that in order to have the power of God upon it in order to reach the world. 
If you connect the dots, we have to be on the same page as a New Testament church. If we're going to have the power of God upon us, and we've got to have the power of God upon us, if we're going to see the lost reach for Christ. And so it really all depends on this business of being in one accord. Now, notice in verse number 14, it mentions who's there. It mentions, first of all, the women. The women. You know, there was a special place in the ministry of Christ for women. And that was not the norm with Judaism or even the the Hebrew culture at all, or even the world at that time, the Greeks and the world. Christianity is the faith that has elevated womanhood, womanhood. And we find out that Christ had these women that ministered to him. It doesn't go into great detail of who they were, but there were a number. And uh, they're mentioned in other places. We find here also the brethren of Christ are mentioned. It mentions the brethren. And there are those who would try to tell you that Christ did not have any brothers. But the Bible teaches contrary to that. We read in Mark 6, 3, they said back in Nazareth, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? It mentions at least four brothers that he had, mentions his sisters, at least a couple more. And in the family of Mary and Joseph, there were at least seven children, maybe eight, nine. We don't know here, but we find out that the, the New Testament mentions these brothers a number of times. Now, this does not negate the virgin birth of Christ whatsoever. He was the firstborn. And once he was out of the virgin womb of Mary, there were other children. Joseph and Mary had a very normal relationship and a normal home there. And this whole attempt of making Mary a perpetual virgin is is some attempt to just elevate her to some higher plateau than God does, than the Bible does here. And the truth be known, there are those who would say, well, these aren't really brothers and sisters, they're cousins. And they would try and explain that away. But if you look back in the Old Testament in Psalm 69, 8, in a passage clearly talking about Christ and, and, and giving us the words of Christ, he says in verse 8, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. There's no explaining that one away. Mary had other children. And the, the word alien there just simply means a foreigner. His brothers, his own siblings, if you will, were skeptical of him. They did not accept him as the Messiah. And, and, and several months earlier than this scenario in Acts 1, John 7, 5 says, For neither did his brethren believe in him. They thought he was beside himself. They thought he had lost it. They were trying to take him home and uh, uh, put him in a home, if you will. And, and, and we find out they didn't believe in him. They were not saved at the time. They were never uh, born again during his earthly ministry. And the conversion of them is not recorded in the Bible. We don't know when they got saved, but we just know they got saved. And, and perhaps sometime over that that past 40 days, it was that resurrection of their half-brother that triggered something that made them say, He is the Messiah. He fulfilled all 300-plus verses written about Him in the Old Testament here, and now they're believers, and now they're there in that upper room, and now they're praying. We find here, James mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Paul says after that, He, Jesus, was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Could it be that the half-brother of James, Christ himself, made a, a post-resurrection appearance to his half-brother and said, James, it's true. I'm alive. I'm the Messiah. Whatever it was, it must have been glorious because now these siblings of the Savior become devoted followers of him and believe in him as the Messiah. Well, in verse number 14, it mentions finally Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is the last mention of Mary in the Bible. You don't find her in the rest of the book of Acts. You don't find her mentioned anywhere in the epistles. You don't find her in the book of the Revelation. There's a, an institution that has given a, an extraordinary amount of inordinate devotion to Mary that the Bible never gives to her. And they have deified her basically. And, and the truth be known, the Bible never exalts Mary. 
never puts her on a higher plane, never lifts her up to some special position here. In fact, we find places in the Bible where she came to Christ thinking perhaps she had some special privileges and got a mild rebuke. She came one time with uh, the other siblings to take him home or to get an audience with him, and he was surrounded by a group, and they said, hey, your mother and and your siblings are are out there. And, And he said, these that do the will of my father are my siblings. This is my family now, if you will. We find another instance in Luke chapter 11 where some gal speaks up in a crowd and hollers out, Blessed be the womb that bare thee and the woman who nursed thee. And Jesus said, Nay, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So he kind of squelched that Mary worship thing, that that elevation of Mary along the line there. And the truth be known, Mary was a sinner. Mary needed a savior. Mary said it with her own mouth in Luke 147, My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Only a sinner needs a Savior, right? And Mary needed a Savior like everybody else. And so this, this unbiblical elevation of Mary is not found in the Bible. Actually, it has its roots in paganism, in heathenism. You can find this long before the time of Christ back in Babylonianism. And and you can find this wife of Nimrod, this Ceramus, who's supposedly this this mother, this queen of heaven kind of a thing. And and, and her son is Tamaz and has her in his arms. And this mother-child cult thing, it goes way, way back before the time of Christ. It is not found in the word of God. Well, anyway... There they are. And I said a moment ago, kind of a, a mixed multitude there, but they're in one accord. And, and you find this, this prayerful rapport. But secondly, you find this picked replacement. It's time for business, unfinished business. And you're going to find a group of apostles, the 11 remaining apostles, get together and try and get the mind of God on a, on a matter that's got to be sanctioned in heaven, though it takes place upon the earth. And I find here a, a marvelous thing, really, that there is a sovereign God who has it all laid out and has it all planned out, and yet he uses us and he works through us. And the truth be known, as you look at the Bible... There are a number of times where you see even unsaved men, guys like Haman, and he is fulfilling the perfect will of God. Guys like Herod fulfilling the perfect will of God. And guys like Cyrus, who, who's mentioned in the Bible a hundred years before he's even born, that he's supposed to let the Jews go back from Babylonian captivity. And they're like, whoa, okay, I guess I better do this here. But you find also a man in the Bible by the name of Judas who really was part of the big scheme and part of the big plan and fulfilled something that was written of him hundreds of years earlier, way back in the Old Testament here. I I find a, a God in heaven who uses a combination of components to bring stuff together. And as you read between the lines of the Bible, you step back and you go, wow, I, I never thought of that before. But even a Red Sea crossing. You've got a God there in heaven who has to work an absolute miracle in part this huge body of water. But he uses an east wind overnight to dry it up. And he uses a mere man by the name of Moses to hold up a rod and to instigate the whole thing. You know, I find uh, places where David's going to battle and and he says, uh, how do I go about this? And God says, just wait until you hear this rushing of the wind over the mulberry trees, and you'll know I've gone ahead of you, and then follow me, and let's do this thing together. We have a God in heaven that works through human instrumentality. And even when when Gideon and his little band of 300 men took on tens of thousands of, of, of the Midianite army here, you find out they say this. It says, And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers, and they cried, the sword of the Lord. But they didn't stop there. They said, and of Gideon. God and man are in league on this one here. And may I say, there are many things in our lives as well that God wants to come alongside of us and work with us. And we need to be sensitive to that. And remember that God is sovereign and he works all things according to his will. But we're part of that plan. We're part of that plan. And so we find out here, first of all, in verse number 15, it says, And in those days, 
Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, let's just stop there. Peter is going to be a leader here. And, and they're up there and they're praying. And he stands up and he says, I've got something to say. The last part of verse 15 mentions the number of names together were about 120. Is this all the born-again Christians alive at that time? No, not by a long shot. In fact, we don't even know if these were all uh, church members or even they were all saved. We do know that Christ for the past three and a half years has been over the three regions of Israel, if you will. He's been way up north in Galilee. He's been in Samaria, and then he's been down south in Judea. And now these, these, this 120 are down in Jerusalem, which is in Judea, and you've got perhaps just a small portion of the folks who'd been saved throughout the regions there in, in, in those open-air crusades that the, that the Lord and the disciples had been holding. I, I, no doubt thousands had been saved. And so where's, where's uh, the woman at the well? Well, she's probably up there in Samaria. And a lot of other folks had gotten uh, saved in Samaria through her witness. Uh, we could talk about the demoniac of, of Gadara and going back to that region, and all those folks got saved. So there's a lot of people, and they're scattered all over the place, and, and they're saved, but they're not part of this group yet. Uh, in fact, in John 4, 1, it tells us that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, than John the Baptist. So there had been a lot of folks out there getting saved as he's evangelizing that part of the world, and a number even before him under the ministry of John the Baptist here, mostly up in Galilee, from what I would guess, because that's where Christ spent most of his earthly ministry, up there on the, the northern tip of the, the Sea of Galilee. And there are no churches there yet. There are no churches in Samaria yet. That's going to follow. Truth be known, when Christ was on this earth, his focus was on these 12 men. He was discipling them. He was training them. This was his church. And there are those who think, well, the church will be started later. And you can't believe the commentaries I read as I'm studying the book of Acts. And they all talk about the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. No. There was a church already birthed during the ministry of Christ. He said, I will build my church in Matthew 16. And we find they're doing everything a church does. They're out there winning souls. They're baptizing converts. They're training those converts. They're sending out missionaries two by two. They're holding the Lord's Supper service. They even have a treasure. There's a church functioning and it's operating before Pentecost. Jesus is the pastor and those men are the members, if you will. And we find out that what we've got here now is, is the, the church in Jerusalem kind of getting its footing, getting its bearings, and it's, it's a transitional time. I don't even know if all these 120 were members. I don't know how, how many of them were kids. But we always talk about there being 120 believers at that time, and there were way more than that. And we're often going to this, this chapter here and, and talking about a church-wide business meeting here when really it was not that at all. You've got the, the choosing of a new a new apostle, and we have to be really careful. In fact, I'll say this early in the study of the book of Acts. We have to be really careful about going to the book of Acts and getting some hard and fast doctrine from it, and some that even trumps the epistles and other, other things we've, we read in the gospel. If you go to the book of Acts and, and you read about speaking in tongues and charismatism and all that, you could really get confused. You could, you could get into Acts 8 and you could find the Holy Spirit working with Philip alongside of an angel. And when's the last time you had an angel tell you to go do something? So this is a transitional book. You're going to find some Old Testament stuff, some hangover stuff, even the casting of lots in this chapter, with New Testament things like being led of the Holy Spirit. And so you can really come up with some fuzzy doctrine if you go to the book of Acts, and a lot of cults have been started that way, and try and, try and make it say something it doesn't say. What we do know is this is a prayer meeting. Could have been a Wednesday night prayer meeting like we have. And uh, what we do know for sure, we find in verse 15. It says, In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of names together were about 120. We find out, he says, men and brethren, and then he's got some business conduct here. Now, these are folks who were continuing the, the, 
the truth of, of uh, Christianity, if you were. Their, their leader had been crucified, but now he was risen. They were not going to be dissuaded or detoured. Their, their leader was alive, and uh, they were going to persevere in prayer. I mean, things were kind of in a holding pattern. They're not told to go out and evangelize the world at this time. They're told to just go tarry at Jerusalem, and this outpouring of the Spirit would come. And so they're praying. They're in one accord. They have, they, there's no murmuring. Their eyes are glowing and shining with, with the truth of the resurrected uh, Savior. And, and we find out that these folks from all walks of life here have come together to pray and ask God to do something for them. Peter stands up in the midst of them. Peter had been somewhat of the appointed leader, uh, if you will, by, by Christ himself in Matthew 16. And then again in John 21, he said, Peter, get back in the race and feed my sheep and, and lead here. So he stands up. There's something bothering him here. There's only 11 apostles. There's supposed to be 12. He'd been reading his Bible, and, and uh, he realized something. There's, it's like a missing tooth. I counted my upper teeth this morning just for the fun of it. Hadn't done that in my whole life and found there were 12. I don't know if you counted yours. But, but having 11 would be like, ooh, there's something missing here. And, 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 and like a missing tooth, Peter goes, we're missing an apostle. There are supposed to be 12, and it was bothering him. They needed a replacement for Judas. Did you know that the Bible tells us in the book of the Revelation in chapter 21 and verse 14 that the wall of heaven has 12 foundations, and in them are the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb? So I've never seen heaven, but, but from the description the Bible gives us here, it has this foundation with 12 layers in it, and on every Layer, you find the name of an apostle. Well, what do you do if Judas now is gone? We need a replacement for that, right? There's got to be 12 names on that foundation for heaven. We also find that Christ said this in Matthew 19, 28. He said to his apostles, Ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So there's 12 thrones in heaven. What do you do if one of them's empty? There's supposed to be 12 apostles actually with the privilege throughout all eternity of judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, we're missing one. We're missing an apostle here. And so they need to have a meeting. They need to elect another apostle. And may I say to you right up front, this was an apostle meeting. This was a meeting of the 11 remaining apostles to decide who is going to be that 12th apostle? And I want to show you here that the rest were really spectators. Peter is speaking as an apostle to apostles here. And there's a couple obvious reasons for that. In verse number 17, he says uh, of Judas, For he was numbered with us and obtained part of this ministry. He mentions us there. Very important. Not everybody, not all the 120 there were part of the three-and-a-half-year ministry of Christ. They did not follow him around, but the apostles did. And so Peter here is obviously addressing those 11 men. He uses the word us there, speaking of those 11 men present there. We find out also that uh, like kind begats like kind. So they're going to have an election here for an apostle, and, and an, a principle that goes way back to the book of Genesis enters in here. There are going to be 11 apostles electing an apostle here. And, and we find also in verse number 21, he says, Wherefore of these men which have companied with us, he's referring to the 11 of them again, all the time that the Lord Jesus Christ went out or in and out from among us, they're going to pick a substitute now. These men here, I think, are probably those men that didn't get chosen. That, that uh, fateful day when Christ called 12 out of the groups of dozens, but maybe those 70 that went out two by two, that's the pool that they're going, to, they're going to gather from. So there were some fringe guys who were really close to being apostles, but they weren't. But we find out again, he uses the word us. They went in and out among us. And so Peter is addressing here 
the apostles, and he's talking about these other men, this replacement from this pool of, of 70 or whatever it is. And then in verse 22, something very important. He mentions beginning from the, the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us. Now, the only men present at the ascension of Christ, and you'll find this every place it's mentioned, were the apostles. There were not hundreds of people there, not even dozens. The only people present at the ascension of Christ were the apostles. And so again, Peter makes mention that they were witnesses with us of his resurrection and the day he was taken up from us, meaning there were 11 men that he's addressing here. And, and so it's a one-time thing, and they're going to replace an apostle, and they're going to have a vote amongst the apostles. Though it sounds like it's in, a, it's in a room with a number of people, you know, we have stuff like this go on every month in this city. When there's commissioner meetings downtown, they, they have the public there, but they have the commissioners up front, and they're the ones conducting the business there. So Peter is conducting this business amongst the 11, and these 11 are going to cast lots, if you will, or, or vote, if you will, to decide who's going to replace Judas. And it's going to be a very, very important thing because I think the most important office on the face of the earth ever has not been some president or some king or some diplomat. It's been an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you think of a more important office than that? You're not going to have teenagers or kids or whatever voting to decide, okay, we're going to, this is going to be the, the new apostle, and he's going to have his name on the foundations. He's going to rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. No, you've got the remaining 11 apostles here trying to make a very, very important decision to fill this vacancy, if you will. And Peter's been reading his Bible here. And he says in verse 16, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. In verse number 20, he quotes something here. For it is written in the book of Psalms, here he's in Psalm 69, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and let his bishopric, means office, let another take. So he's reading the Bible, and he finds something written here in the Psalms that needs to be fulfilled. The treachery of Judas was predicted back in the Old Testament. It, it didn't catch Christ by surprise. It did everybody else. But Jesus had said in John 6, 64, There are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And so... Jesus knew all about Judas being a phony, and yet here's God, and he's sovereign, and, and uh, knew all that was coming, but he did not force Judas to betray Jesus Christ. That was a decision that Judas had made here. And we find out that Judas is perhaps an example of the, the greatest waste of opportunity in all of history. I mean, he was afforded a privilege, afforded only 12 men ever in history, to, to live alongside the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for three and a half years. And yet, he blows it. He had selfish motives. He perhaps liked that business of ruling and reigning. He was amongst those arguing who'd be the greatest. He was in it for the power. He was in it for the fame. He was in it for the money. And when it didn't look like Christ was taking it in that direction... When it, when it didn't look like Christ was going to overthrow that Roman oppression, he, he decided to cut his losses and settle for 30 pieces of silver and sell out the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse number 17, Peter talks about it. He says, For he, Judas, was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. He was numbered with them. He was friends with them. He was the treasurer of, of that small church there. We find out he was there helping the poor and he was there uh, healing the sick and, and, and feeding the hungry and, and casting out devils and sitting at the feet of Christ. He was one of them. And, and Peter makes reference to that. He was one of us. But in verse number 20, he mentions it is written in the book of the Psalms. There's a lot written in the Psalms about Judas. Psalm 109 verse 8 says, Let his days be few 
and let another take his office. And then in Psalm 55, I won't have you turn there, but we find out in verse 12, Christ is talking, he says, for it is not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I could have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide, mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God in company here. And we find out that Judas threw that all away. And now he needs to be replaced. Those who operate slaughterhouses have, in many instances, what they call a Judas sheep. And a Judas sheep is one who's been trained to lead the other sheep to the slaughter and then just back out himself. That was Judas. The name lives on. Now, there's some confusion. In in verse 18, it says, Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. And falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, that is the midst of that field, and his bowels gushed out. This is the end of Judas, but... It doesn't line up with an account given over in Matthew 27, 5, which says that he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. So which is it? Did did he fall over a cliff and, and, and just split open, or did he hang himself, and the truth be known, both? Apparently he hung himself, but the rope broke or something took place, and there's a lot of speculation in the commentaries that nobody noticed him for days, and he bloated and decayed, and, uh, you know, I won't get ugly about it, but, but anyway, he fell from some distance, and, and the rope gave or whatever gave, and the, the truth be known, his bowels burst asunder, as described in verse number eight, 18 here. Now, the verse also mentions that he bought... This field with the blood money. He didn't buy it himself, but the Pharisees took the 30 pieces of silver back. And being the hypocrites they were, they said, we can't bring this back into the treasury. Now they're all concerned about keeping the letter of the law. Where was all that when they were breaking over a dozen laws to have Christ crucified? But now they're saying, we can't put that money in there. And and the little legalists are so phony that they say, let's purchase this field with it, make it a common field for folks to be buried in and stuff like that. And that's where Judas meets his end. We find out it mentions he went to his place. And that's an interesting expression there. And I talked about it a few months ago, the speculation whether uh, Judas is reserved in a special place right now to come back as the Antichrist. And there are a lot of theologians who feel that because he's mentioned as the son of perdition that he is going to make a comeback and we won't go there. But we, we know that, that the apostles needed a replacement. We, we see the prayerful rapport. We see the picked replacement. And then finally, we see the preached resurrection. In verse 21, Peter says, Wherefore these men, which have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Notice, first of all, that this substitute, this replacement, had to have the baptism of John. John the baptism, the man sent from God, and, and the man who's, who's, who's got the authority. May I just quickly interject here, not anyone has the authority to baptize. I, I, I find the realm of Christianity getting so sloppy with that. And I read of athletes and entertainers and musicians who claim to be born again, and they're out there as mavericks and freelancers just baptizing people when really... If we had time to go to the Great Commission, Matthew 28, I'd show you. That was given to a local church. And so we find out here that the replacement for for, uh, Judas has to have John's baptism here. And, And he's going to be preaching and being a witness of the resurrection. We find that the doubts of these disciples had dissolved And now they're going to go through the fire. And now they're going to go through the flood. And now they're going to be tortured. And now they're going to be martyred. And they better be ready for this. They better have what it takes here. They're going to be preaching that resurrection. And the replacement for Judas had better be solid. And so they go way back to somebody that had his roots with John the Baptist. In verse number 23, it says, And they appointed two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. Here's a couple of men 
They go way back. Apparently, they're equally qualified here, but there's, there's a serious impasse. They, they don't know which one. They, the apostles say, all right, we can narrow it down to these two here. But now they're asking God for some help. By the way, we don't know anything about these men. As we read the Bible, there's not one other place in the Bible where they're mentioned. This is it. This is all we know about them. Well, in verse 24, it says, And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. God, you know the hearts of all men. Which of these two? You know, we can all put on a facade and a good air and, and, and pose as something that we're not. But God knows the hearts. And they said, God, you know the hearts of these men. There's, there's no higher office on the face of the earth ever, and we don't want to fumble this one. Lord, help us here. An apostle had unique power. Uh, an apostle had unique privileges. They're mainly the writers of the New Testament. They're the guardians of the truth. They're the guardians of the New Testament church. And, and, and the, the, the history of the world for the next 2,000 years is going to be changed forever by these 12 men. Who is the 12th? Who is the right man here? Well, in verse number 26, it says, And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11. You know, you read this, and if you're like me, you go, what happened here? They gave forth their lots. Well, you read the commentaries once again, and, and uh, you kind of scratch your heads. Was it a vote? Uh, some of the commentaries comp compare it to, to rolling dice or, or uh, choosing straws. This, this process of lots is, again, transitional. It's an Old Testament thing. And, and that's all they know, I guess, at this point. They're using some Old Testament method here. Proverbs 16.33 mentions the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Apparently, it was something that they did, yet they looked to God to sanction it and to lead in it. We read in Proverbs 18.18, 18, the lot causeth contentions to cease and parteth between the mighty. And so whatever they do, it involves these lots, and they elect an apostle. Now, was it valid? I know that the question mark always goes up here, and I've, I've talked to preacher friends, and, and, and they think, that you know what, they took matters in their own hands here and asked God to sanction it, and that Paul should have been that 12th apostle, and so on and so forth. I don't know whose name is going to be on that foundation, that 12th name, but i got to go with what I read here in Acts chapter 1, did they run ahead of God? I don't know. I believe they, they wanted to fill a vacancy before this empowering came, this Pentecost, and so they were trying to do what they did, and we could speculate on it, but the, the truth is this. The number now stands at 12. It's, it's complete, and there's nothing left but to go forward. And the next thing on God's agenda is Pentecost here, and these 12 would be projected into a hostile world to turn it upside down for the Lord Jesus Christ. And they would. The fate of the entire human race then really rested in what they did from this point on. By the way, that fate of the human race today rests in our hands as God's people and as a New Testament church. And I hope our witness is what it ought to be. Let's witness in the remaining days that we have left until Christ comes back of this resurrection.